when Harris came in, she did a completely different approach. And that's where you got the whole vibes and the joy and moving forward and turning the page and everything. But for the most part, she was a happy warrior. That's over. <laughs> that, that ship has sailed. She's no longer a happy warrior. I think that our country is right now in the most dangerous position it's ever been. confident that there will be a peaceful transfer of power in January 2025. If Trump wins, no, I'm not confident. Take a look at what happened. Oh. You're considered the most liberal United States senator. I, I Somebody said that. Campaign rally is not a press conference. Why isn't she at a press conference? She's the vice president. She can handle the questions. Why not do it? Dana, I think the, the, the most important and most significant aspect of my policy perspective and decisions is my values have not changed. Four months from now, we will have an incredible victory. And we will begin the four greatest years in the history of our country. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Campaign Games, the game of survival for both the candidates and the voters. I am here this morning, early in the morning, with someone that we all miss very much because I think you guys were, you probably were tired of listening to just me. Rachel is back from the treacherous com country that is the U. Well, actually, I guess we're the traitors, aren't we? We're the <laughs> Thankfully, yes. But she is back from the UK and we're going to talk about happy campaigns and sad campaigns today. <laughs> well, I'm glad to be here. It was a great trip, but there's no place like home. I know. How is, how, so did you, was there anything in particular that you missed? It's like when you, she texted me that she was headed back and I'm like, are you missing ice and 32 ounce fountain drinks, Diet Cokes? <laughs> yes, I did miss my styrofoam Chick-fil-A Diet Coke, even though I'm trying to cut back on Diet Coke. This election season is not helping with that. But I just missed all the things you normally miss when you travel abroad. You miss your creature comforts. But we had an excellent two weeks, saw beautiful churches and landmarks and ate excellent food. People who tell you that the food in London is, or in England in general, is boring. I don't think that they visited lately because it was just chef's kiss. So good. And... It was wonderful. We had a great time. But like I said, glad to be back with you so we can work our way through the next 13 days. I know. It's just, it's going to be easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Nothing exciting is going to be happening over the next two weeks. The big announcement is that um, something I had like a little note, right? And hadn't mentioned it. Totally almost forgot about it. But the big announcement for this morning is that Trump is official for Rogan on Friday. I am excited. And I had people message me. After I posted about it on Instagram, saying, why is this such a big deal? I'm like, what? What? Three or four hours of unscripted Trump with Joe Rogan? How did that not be exciting? Number one podcast. This guy is basically like the podcast online new generation Oprah. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, it's just he has like be, 14 it's million great. listeners. Yeah, this is going to be huge. And the and fact is that it's just another example of how Trump is able to... Just go out of his element, um, which it's not even his mm -hmm. element. It Because, I mean, he is going to be in his element, but just not be scripted, not because there's, it's not, Rogan, I mean, he might have some general questions, but he's a pretty free-flowing conversationalist. I don't know if he's going to do the full three hours. No, I'm like an hour, maybe. How, much, how long did, was he on um, Theo Vaughn's podcast? Was that, what, 45 minutes? Something like that. It was about 45 yeah. minutes. So, yeah. I mean, um, but the great part about Rogan is that you can't always predict what he's going to say. So there's no way of really preparing for being on that podcast. I mean, you might know some high level questions and whatnot, but I just think you have to be on your game. You kind of have to know where you stand on the issues. And again, I just, will Kamala go on that? I mean, not, to, uh, of course she would have because... She views Rogan as adversarial to her, to Democrats, to conventional machine think. But I don't think she could sustain. She doesn't have enough to talk about for to fill a 20 minute interview. Well, really, she would just freak out. Let's just be honest. Yeah. She would freak out and then get mad, <laughs> which is what's happening completely. Yeah. And I mean, I would love to see it. I would mm -hmm. love to see her go on because it would not go well. But. I don't think necessarily it would favor her. You know what I mean? So I, of course, yeah. 
it's not, the point is that it's absolutely not going to happen. So speaking of which, speaking of capabilities, being happy, if you've been living under the rock or under a rock over the weekend, you may have missed or don't know that Trump broke the brains of the media and <laughs> went and did um, a campaign, a faked campaign stunt where he pretended to be a real employee of McDonald's for a full 30 minutes. I mean, it is, it was just too much. Have you seen all his clips? Or not all of them, but you saw a few of them. And I don't remember where I was because, of course, there's a five-hour difference between, yeah, we were in London and all of a sudden I'm just seeing tweets and Instagram posts of Trump in a McDonald's like employee apron. And then it just yeah. every single post was like breaking news, breaking news, breaking news. And it, <laughs> I am like trying to parrot, trying to, I don't know where we were. I think we were at Buckingham Palace, like walking through the streets of London. And I'm trying, I'm trying to kind of gather <laughs> my, my thoughts, like what's going on. And then I just put down my phone. I'm like, I cannot, I can't do this right now. I have to revisit because he was breaking the internet. Yeah, it was great. I got a little super cut here. A lot of fun here, everybody. Oh my God, oh my God. Hello, everybody. You can take this, right? And you know this is compliments of Trump, okay? Yes, thank okay. you. Mr. President, yes. please don't let the United States become Brazil. My name is Brazil. Don't let the United States we'll become Brazil. Brazil. We're going to make it better than ever, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you over there. Thank you. Oh, my God. Have a good time. Thank nice you. Bye, darling. Did he call her darling? Bye, darling. Yes. Like the show. And then he's like, I wouldn't like mind this job. Good. This job would be great. Yeah. Look at oh, that. Mr. Look at that. Oh, Thank you, Mr. President. You made it possible for ordinary people like us to be. Uh, you're not ordinary. Thank you so much. I can see. We pray for you, and you are the type of person we want to be the president. He's so amenable. Like he's so in his element right here. Thank you. You think about it. I guess that's right. Listen to him. Never touches the human hand. Never touches the human hand because he's a germaphobe. It's Kamala's birthday. She's, turned She's 60, sixty years old. Do you want to say? Anything? Yes, I would say happy birthday, Kamala. She's turning sixty. Uh, Did you get her some fries? I think I'll get her some flowers. Why not to beat her? Maybe again? I'll get her some fries. You're right. That might be. I'll give her, give her some McDonald's. I'll get her a McDonald's hamburger. Thank you. No, it is her birthday. Why it is true. Right? I I happy birthday, Kamala. Happy birthday. Why not? See happy birthday, Kamala. I mean, come on. How can you not love that? Only our media could find that so offensive that they start going on all their morning shows and saying it was an insult to McDonald's employees. I mean, why? And then they're harping on him and they're saying it's a stunt. Well, of course it is. He's campaigning. That's all these people do when they campaign. That is what campaigning okay. is. What I thought the most like they're all losing their mind, right? The most yeah. absolute, hands down, hilarious post to me. Um, Newsweek on X, they posted an article, of course, mm -hmm. promoting their article. But the caption of the article goes, rumors have been circulating on social media that the former president, Donald Trump's visit to the popular fast food chain was staged. Duh. Rumors? <laughs> it's not rumors, it's reality. And this is what politicians do <laughs> newsflash to those in the media <laughs> you think there that was rumors i mean i so it stupid. just cracked me up i'm like have you guys completely lost your minds here yes they have because he was kind and he was nice to the people who drove through and they said nice things about him and he was normal it was a normal political campaign stop and they just can't handle that because he appeared to be a normal, nice person. And that's really hard for them. Well, because, I'm, I mean, if you think about it, it goes against their latest talking point. Now, of course, they're going to be like, this just shows how much more dangerous and how more manipulative he is because he's letting the guard down and making himself come off as a nice guy when really he's a threat to our democracy. I guarantee you there's some moron out there doing that talking point. Of course. but. 
what is upsetting too is that it it is there are multi layers here. You guys have to understand when it comes to this stunt, okay? Because the root of the stunt is comes from Harris and the fact that she says that she worked at McDonald's when she was in college, and there is no evidence of that whatsoever. It's literally just her word, and that was a story that mm -hmm. literally popped up in 2019. There is right. no mention of it prior to that. There's no mention of it in any previous books, any previous resumes, nothing. Like it was never a talking point for her till she started to run for president in 2019. Yeah, and she needed to be like the middle class common man. Yeah, exactly. Like when it started to be a talking point that she needed to benefit her, then all of a sudden she's working at one of the most iconic fast food places of that is a staple of American history, McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I don't. And so Trump's like, I don't believe you. There's no proof. But hey, I'm going to go work at McDonald's and then I will work at McDonald's more than you ever worked at McDonald's. I want to know if it was his idea or the staffer. I want to know whose idea it was. It was brilliant. It was great. I guarantee you it was his idea. This man is a master troll. Like he is. He's just he has a great so troll game. He does. It is. I mean, this idea is completely on brand for him. And it was great, too, because. You know, he's poking fun at Kamala, but then at the same time, he's like being sweet to Kamala because it's her birthday. But then wow. he's taking digs at her because he's like, I've worked here more than Kamala ever has. He's smooching with the people. It was, I just thought it was really genius politicking coming into the home stretch of the election at a time that is really the perfect time to start to because the Democrats are already panicking because of the way the the momentum is behind Trump. Mm -hmm. And instead of them, I don't know, just kind of letting it go, they continue to talk about it to make them look even crazier. It's almost like a, a panic attack or something like that. Yeah, they can't get control of their Apple teas. Well, what I thought, this is just an example of the complete meltdown that was happening on the media. And I think Newsweek had theirs because they're like the rumor that it might not be true, which I'm like, okay. duh, obviously. <laughs> then Newsweek goes and attacks the McDonald's franchise that he went to, pointing out that they had a failed health inspection. How petty. Like, how petty can you get? It's so juvenile. Like, what is the point to that? Why are you going to attack this little business? Like, it just, it's so ridiculous. But the best one was the New York Times where, because you see Trump, he's there, he's in his element. He's got his button down shirt and his cufflings with his apron and the red tie that perfectly matches McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And the New York Times goes and takes a dig at the way he was dressed it's it's childish truly and you're seeing i know you and i were talking a little bit about this yesterday you're seeing just how scared they are that this is what they're talking about this is what they're stooping to because they're scared they're grasping at anything they can find or that they think might have some kind of effect on the voters i don't even know who they think that they're talking to who's going to listen and care about their opinion about whether he's wearing a hairnet or if his outfit is weird but this is how afraid they are of him, but also of Kamala losing. Like, they just can't even comprehend what might happen in 13 days. They're so scared. I thought, because just to go through the New York Times really quick. So first they go after the way he was dressed. Like, no hairnet. He's wearing, I thought this one was really funny. He's like, he's certainly the only man in the franchise on Sunday packing orders in a shirt with French cuffs. French cuff shirts, which are fastened with cuff links at the wrist. Mr. Oh Trump's gosh. naturally were gold are an increasing anachronism. For many American men, they are sometimes to be worn, if ever, at weddings. Barrel cuffs with sewn-in buttons are far more common for shirts sold off the rack. Mr. Trump, who made his name in the gilded Gordon Gecko 80s, continues to cling to his cufflinks. Or he just has good taste. There's lots of people who wear cufflinks still. These people are so out of touch. First of all, no one cares what... He's wearing, he's at a McDonald's. Not one person has thought about that, except for these people who sit in their comfortable little bougie offices and write this 
garbage that passes as journalism. It's so ridiculous. I'm sorry. It's laughable, really, this one, which is why we're laughing. I, it is absolutely hilarious. So this next one I thought was great because we all know that there during Obama, there was like the whole birtherism theory that yeah. allegedly Obama could wasn't eligible to be president because he wasn't actually born in the United right. States or whatever. And Trump was someone that was really kind of pushing that talking point, right? So this article opens with birtherism meets burgerism. Oh, and brother. This, How do these people have jobs? I know. This is so insane. This is specifically tying, like they are connecting the dot of Trump promoting the birtherism conspiracy with Kamala Harris not having worked at McDonald's being an equivalent conspiracy theory. Mind you, there is ample lack of evidence that legitimately brings into question about whether or not Harris has ever been an employee at McDonald's. And so one of the best, Beth, I got, I got a little lisp there. One of the best <laughs> lines here is that they're trying to fact check Trump in this article. Now, in the subtitle, like in the byline of it, it says Trump has claimed without evidence that Miss Harris never worked at a fast food chain. Her campaign and friend say she did. Okay. <laughs> like they could say a lot of things. Exactly. Like, this is your evidence. This is... Did McDonald's say you worked there? I would like to hear from McDonald's. What I thought was funny here is that with the... This is the article. It says, as with the birtherism conspiracy, this one puts Miss Harris and her aides in something of a bind. Tracking down pay stubs or other documentation from long ago would be a difficult task for almost anyone. McDonald's corporate re representatives have ignored media requests for corroborating information and trying to knock down Mr. Trump's claims could also breathe life into them. And then it goes, the campaign did not make any of Ms. Harris's friends or family members available for interviews about the recollections of her experience there. But the New York Times interviewed a friend who has known Ms. Harris as a teenager and remained in touch with the family for years afterwards. And this friend, a close friend, attended high school with her and recalls Miss Harris having worked at McDonald's around that time. If you read further into the article, it actually says that she remembers Harris's mother mentioning that she worked at McDonald's at that time and that oh they gosh. haven't actually been, they weren't friends for a while and they didn't get back in touch until I think she started to run, I think in 2018 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So this is about hearsay or like a chain you know, yeah. like a game of telephone, like third person information. And the point is this. Now, Democrats, progressives, liberal influencers are using the word conspiracy so fast and loose that it means nothing anymore. It's like racism it or white supremacy. Those words mean so little now because they just people slap it on whatever they want to to legitimize whatever talking point or discussion or narrative. And so if they don't like something that's happening, they're like, oh, it's a conspiracy. And it's really not a conspiracy. It's just if a candidate is going to say something and make a claim, just give us receipts, show us the facts. And they make it sound like those of us who are kind of questioning it or calling Kamala a liar or just asking questions that we're making a big deal out of nothing. And this could be nothing. Just show us when you work there. Give us a picture. Show us a pay stub. Like, it's just, it's not a big deal at all. They're making it a big deal by saying that we're making it a big deal. Just don't lie. Don't say stuff unless you can prove it. Well, and people who are wondering, like, why does this matter? Because it goes again to her trying to evaluate the candidate. Are mm -hmm. they being honest? Are they trying to manipulate you, emotionally manipulate you into voting for them? And that would be in line for what many people suspect about Kamala Harris. And then it's also really gross. I, you know, I, I say this all the time, how the media is so trash because, you know, you have the New York Times putting out this article that's not really, I don't know, practicing proper journalism and is taking the word of just one random friend who happened to talk to her mom at one point and heard that she may have worked at McDonald's versus the Washington Free Beacon, who has actually been doing, I don't know, journalism 
and and researching. And one of the things that they have pointed out, they have an article and I'll, there'll be a link in the show notes. But, you know, they point out that, like I mentioned before, that she never mentioned McDonald's until she began her 2019 campaign, that there are no that the McDonald's job doesn't appear in any applications, any autobiographies or any resumes prior to 2019. And that the narrative on the story shifted because initially she said that she worked there to help pay her way through college, but then changed it and said it was just primarily about extra spending money. Yeah, this is why we're asking questions because she has a track record of kind of massaging facts and stories to suit like whatever moment she's in. And Tim Wolf does the same thing. We know he tells lots of fun stories that later we find out are not entirely accurate. So these things matter. And someone who's campaigning for Kamala, President Obama, made a big deal about trying to take down Donald Trump for things he says. And he was saying this weekend, Barry was saying this weekend, that every single thing that a president says matters. Every single thing. Okay. And so if that's the case, and we all should accept that and believe that because they have this tremendous outsized influence on American culture and government and policy, then we should be able to like adjudicate these things and not be made to sound weird because we're wanting just basic truths and facts. It's not hard to produce any shred of evidence that you work there. It's not that difficult. I worked at Juice Stop. Like, 25, 30 years ago, and I could, if I needed to, find some kind of evidence that I worked there for a couple weeks for my first paycheck. This is not hard. Well, and what's interesting in this case is that since she came on the scene as or in, was instituted as the Democrat candidate, we they've been trying to sell us as if Kamala was an Obama 2.0, right? And what's interesting is that She comes, she has this McDonald's talking point. And believe me, she was trying to be Obama 2.0 back in 2019. It wasn't just today. They just kind of revamped it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, when Obama was running for president, he talked about how he used to scoop ice cream at Baskin Robbins. And he Mm -hmm. was, you were able to verify that claim. He was able to tell you the location, job. And now she, I, I don't know if she has specifically said this was her first job. At that time, you would take a picture of yourself. I'm in my uniform. This is my first job. You know what I mean? And there's no evidence of that. And so that's why people are going like, I think it's kind of weird. And I also feel like she has started to back away from the story because of the questions about it. To give an example of how the media just completely had a total meltdown and how their brain literally broke. (laughs) I want to play this video for you, Rachel, because you said you had not seen this. I'm excited. And this is CBS. And this was one of the moderators on the CBS, what do you call that? Debate. Cheese. It's early. (laughs) And I know it's so early in the morning, but she was one of the ones that was debating Trump, essentially, right? During the CBS debate. I just, you guys, listen to how she talks. This is an intro. Listen to how she talks about the Harris campaign versus the Trump campaign. Uh, Selection Day is just over two weeks away, and the fight for every single last undecided vote in battleground states is intensifying. Vice President Kamala Harris is targeting disaffected Republican voters by hitting the trail with Liz Cheney in the crucial blue wall states of Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Cheney was a powerful Republican congresswoman, and today she called Harris a responsible adult. As for former President Donald Trump, he was back in North Carolina again, pushing false claims about FEMA and immigrants. That's after he spent the weekend slinging a crude insult at Harris, engaging in lewd locker room talk about the late golfing legend Arnold Palmer and staging a campaign stunt at a Pennsylvania McDonald's. I mean, it's like she is wonderful. This candidate is was so what's the word? What's she's so brat and perfect. And she's just this campaign she's running. She's bringing people together. And this horrible monster who is running against her is the worst. Please don't vote for him. That's basically what it was. And then what I thought was hilarious was like, and a campaign stunt at a, I ca- like fast food. She denigrates the whole, ca- I just, I just thought it was hilarious when everyone, it is, it was objectively 
a great campaign, like retail campaign. And this is something that's yeah. what is hilarious is that you have to understand that this is something that is so typical and classic of campaigning. You see people yes. at fairs, you see people at local businesses, they'll get behind the counter. Who was it? At someone at one point was like pouring a beer during some kind of campaign event. I can't remember. I don't understand why it's all of a sudden offensive. This is so standard. It's this is very common campaigning. This is campaigning 101. They do this. They go places, they meet people, they shake hands, they pretend like they're normal, like us. Every candidate does this. This is not abnormal. Why are we acting like this is bad or mean or offensive? <laughs> like, it, again, it just shows how afraid they are. They're doing it. The way the, the reason that this is happening is because they are in a full blown panic because the momentum yep. currently, according to the polls, if we're going to put any little bit of trust into them and just the general behavior of the Harris campaign, you can tell that Trump is having a good time. He is in his element. He's relaxed. He's enjoying the campaign. When you're not doing well, you look miserable. And suddenly the joy in the Harris campaign <laughs> is gone. I mean, it is a it is quite a contrast. As he gets, as we get closer and we inch closer day by day to this election, he gets kind of more free-flowing, fun, jaunty, and she just gets angrier and she becomes more shouty and her face is doing this like the angry face, the angry eyes. <laughs> and she's just getting more and more mad and he's just having the time of his life. It's just out there talking to people, serving fries, chatting, wishing Kamala a happy birthday. It's just, it, the difference is real. Well, and it's just, it's funny that you say that because remember the campaign, Harris's campaign started with Joy being brat. She was positive and smiley. And now all of a sudden, because one of the things that the Biden campaign was facing a lot of criticism on towards the end was that this talking point of democracy is on the ballot and that he's a threat to democracy. This fear mongering negative talking point was not working. So when Harris came in, she did a completely different approach. And that's where you got the whole vibes and the joy and moving forward and turning the page and everything. But for the most part, she was a happy warrior. That's over. <laughs> that, that ship has sailed. She's no longer a happy warrior. Talking about the angry face, this is now, if you don't have a life such as myself and you scroll to social medias, there has been compilations of this particular speech sliced together. So of course she can't go off script. So once she has a talking point, you're going to hear it everywhere she goes and she performs it exactly the same way every time. And this is the latest one. Should never again stand behind the seal of the president of the United States. That has strong Dwight Schrute vibes at that conference when he's like slapping the podium. She's she's inching closer and closer to that. It's weird. Oh my gosh, that is so true. It's like I did an Instagram reel after she did her Brett Bear interview. It's like, what two clips give you the same vibe? What? You are <laughs> totally right. This yeah. clip and Schrute are totally on point. They are exactly yeah. the same. But she's clearly not happy. And she's doing that talking, that never again, the same finger pointing, the same looking around, like she's just really strong and defiant. Mm -hmm. She's doing it everywhere. She's literally yep. doing it everywhere. And it's embarrassing. And to, <laughs> can we just talk real quick about the latest announcement, which I would like to welcome, um, Tulsi Gabbard to the Republican Party. Welcome, Tulsi. It was a matter of time, but why do you think right this moment? Why do you think right now? As opposed to a couple months ago? My thought, I would say that she's probably been spending more time with, you know, obviously she's campaigning. She's been spending more time with Trump. She's been spending more time with what we call the new, the realignment, the new Republican Party. And she's recognized how far gone the Democrats have become. And, and 
now she's she wants to because I see her as someone who is loyal. And if she believes mm-hmm. in something, she she's cautious about putting her name behind it. But when she believes in it, you know, she wants to put her name behind it. I really I even though we may not agree on some policy issues, I earnestly believe that she thinks about that sort of thing. And yeah. I think the more time that she spent on the campaign with Trump and his surrogates and meeting the people that support him, you know, she's now more comfortable to say, yeah, I'm going to be a Republican now. Like the Republican Party has changed. And, and the fact is like what we've talked about in previous episodes, I really feel like the Republican Party is going back to its roots. And I'm talking about like Lincoln type roots, you know what I mean? Before the complete neocon invasion that turned into the Uniparty And so I think that's why she's doing it. And let me tell you, I welcome the trade. The trade of Cheney for Tulsi Gabbard. Great. I'll take it. Absolutely. (laughs) Ready? Yep. Let's talk about Liz Cheney and why we're totally fine with her hopping over to the other side. It's wild to me. So she was on Monday campaigning with uh Kamala in Pennsylvania and in Michigan I believe like they were jumping around they did uh several locations what are those conversations like in the back room I mean that must be awkward they all really hate each other when you get down to it they're not hanging out on the weekends they're not friends they've been antagonistic to each other for forever their parties especially that's gotta be weird pretending we all of a sudden are gonna make nice weird I mean, and I think it's just obvious that they're bonding over mutual hatred for Trump. There's no other motivating factor. None. There's not any motivating factor. The only thing I can think of is that maybe Cheney is hopeful that if Harris stays in office, that funding will go through for Ukraine. But what else? Why? The only unifying thing you have is, like you said, mutual disgust for another person that's not a strong bond well and then she's on the campaign trail with harris and i think what the harris campaign thinks they're accomplishing is that cheney will be tempting or will bring over the nikki haley vote yeah no it's not gonna happen it's not gonna happen absolutely not and look i got my issues with nikki haley obviously Mm -hmm. i'll take nikki haley over cheney you know well, yeah, Cheney made a statement at one of the events that I was listening to where she said, I mean, she's just lying. She's like, there are going to be millions of Republicans, millions who vote for you, Kamala. There's just going to be millions of them. And I was like, no, there's not. What are you talking about? I mean, I get it that politicians and they lie, but that's just something like, why are you there? What are you saying? What do you think Kamala is going to do for our country that is worth you basically selling your soul, politically speaking, to promote her. I just, these people hate Donald Trump so much, they'll really do anything. For a long time, Cheney was, she's always called herself very pro-life, right? And she mm-hmm. was on the campaign trail with Harris, basically being like, it's okay if you're pro-life for you to support Kamala Harris, who wants, who was literally just last night, on NBC News being interviewed, which I will say last night's interview was a decent interview. She did, uh, I forget her, Haley Jackson. She did give Harris quite a bit of a push. But I think one of the most disturbing clips that I saw from last night, which I shared on my yep. Instagram, was on the issue of abortion. Where that was wild. she was asked about, yeah, I she was asked about abortion. You know, Harris is again, of course, we know she wants to codify Roe versus Wade. And then when Jackson asked her, well, what about religious exemptions? She flat out said, I don't believe there should be any exemptions for something that is the right. I don't know if she said constitutional right of a woman. I think I have, let me see if I have the clip here because I was just blown away by this response. It was telling to me, here we go, me, let me play it for you guys because I don't want to misquote her. I mean, not that I really care, but I don't want to misquote her. 
<laughs> Let's listen to her real quick. What concessions would be on the table? Religious exemptions, for example, is that something that you would consider? I don't think we should be party? making concessions when we're talking about a fundamental freedom to make decisions about your own body. To Republicans like, for example, uh, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, who would back something like this on a Democratic agenda if, in fact, Republicans control Congress, would you offer them an olive branch? Or is that off the table? Is that not an option for you? I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals. So you're telling me Cheney, who is pro-life, is now giving Republicans permission to vote for Kamala Harris, who basically supports no restrictions whatsoever on abortion, including religious liberties, okay, which is a First Amendment issue, by the way, people. This isn't just like some, this isn't some made up right, like the right to abortion, where she thinks that, you know, abortion is a constitutional right. This is within our Bill of Rights. It is our First Amendment. It is free speech, freedom of religion. And she's like, no, nah, I don't think so. Yeah. And if anybody has any question about how antagonistic this woman is, to religious beliefs, deeply held religious beliefs that she says all the time, you don't have to give those up in order to vote for me. Well, she just told you you will have to give those up. If you have any doubt that this woman is against you and your religious beliefs and how you can practice them, that's your answer right there. So if your religious beliefs and your freedom to exercise those beliefs means anything to you, then you should be paying attention to that clip. She said it all. It was very clear. And it's really important. This is a very consequential issue for people who have those deeply held beliefs. I just, it's just an example of how she talks out both sides of her mouth. And if you don't know, because I actually had this question where she's not talking about forcing people against their religious beliefs to have an abortion. That is not the exemption that is required. The exemption is about institutions, practitioners, health insurance, anything, or forcing American citizens to use their taxpayer dollars. Like if she wants, she wants single payer health care. She wants to expand Medicare that, you know, covering the, co the uh, reproductive health, which would include, and I did air quotes there. I'm not being serious. Um, that that would include abortion. So, for example, if um, a Catholic church or if you are a nurse practitioner or a doctor that uh, is working at a women's facility, if you weren't willing to provide abortion, then you I don't know, maybe she might come after you and take away your license. I'm assuming this would also apply to like organizations and companies that offer health insurance to their employees and they would like to not offer certain insurance coverage that includes abortion pills or abortion care they would be told that's too bad you're going to do that anyways exactly and we can get into the discussion too because trump has proposed for ivf to be covered by insurance or to pay for ivf and it's the same thing and i think he definitely merits that criticism just kind of in the yeah, same for sure. realm however i will give him the benefit of the doubt that he hasn't really fully thought out the religious implications of that no of course not because he views ivf as a positive thing and he views abortion as a negative thing and we that's a totally different conversation that we as believers have had you and i um but they're not the, what he's saying and what she's saying are not the same thing and they are not definitely we need to talk about if trump's going to decide that every single employer has to offer ivf that's a problem but these are not equivalent issues because of the intent behind this. He is viewing it as offering something good. We can disagree with that. He is viewing this as taking away a right that belongs to Americans in order to usher in her type of morality surrounding the murdering of babies. They're not equivalent at all. And I would, to give him the benefit of the doubt, just because this is what he has demonstrated, is that even if he did try to do that, which we can definitely get into that discussion at another time, he would still apply religious exemptions. Of course. As opposed to Harris is like, no religious exemptions. So let's just, Good let's just put that out there. Yep. And I think this is just an example of how she is not she tries she went over the weekend and was like campaigning at a black church in georgia it was her birthday they had stevie wonder there she did this whole speech where she was trying to talk about 
the good Samaritan and like. No, it was a political sermon. It was a sermon. That's what she was. It was being branded at. She's trying to guilt Christians into <laughs> if you don't agree with me, you are not a good Samaritan. If you don't open the borders, you're not a good Samaritan. If you don't pay for everybody's health insurance, you're not a good Samaritan, which is such a, a like manipulation of the word. It just makes me angry. And then you have this church is allowing her to do it from the pulpit, which makes me even angrier. Yeah, because every single time any Republican has a guest that speaks about politics or they give a political election no. sermon or I mean, can you imagine if Donald Trump stood in a church and they lost their minds when Donald Trump had like his God bless the USA Bible? Can you imagine if he stood on a Sunday morning and delivered a political sermon? They would lose their ever loving minds christian nationalism would be the headline of every single paper for a week of the news cycle but it's totally permissible if she does it because it's for the good of the country this is loving this is what is kind and empathetic and it's just it's such a double standard and this clip this abortion you know what this interview on nbc over the same weekend or i think it was maybe on friday like she was at a rally and she was talking about abortion and somebody in the audience, some, I think they were like college students, uh, called out Jesus is, no, I think it was like Christ is Christ. Christ is King, Jesus is Lord. There were two of them. Her immediate response, knee jerk without skipping a beat, was like, oh, I think you're at the wrong rally. You need to go to the smaller rally down the street. Said with contempt, complete contempt. That was a knee jerk, honest, off script reaction because Christians, Specifically, she has no respect for them. She is hostile to them. And you see yep. that in that immediate reaction at the rally. And you also see that with what she was saying at the NBC during the NBC interview versus when she was at another event, somebody cried out to her, yelled out to her about what about the genocide, talking about Gaza. And she's like, I hear what you're saying. And that's a valid point. So tell me, tell me who she cares about. Tell me who mm -hmm. she's worried about. I'm just so grossed out by it. <laughs> There's a lot to be grossed out by. <laughs> it, these aren't small fluff yeah. issues. These are fundamental rights that will be trampled on should she assume the Oval Office. We should all be concerned and grossed out. Absolutely. And during that same interview, just to touch on she again, which I talked about this when she did her Brett Baer interview where she was asked about uh, taxpayer funding for transgender you know, treatment um, or supporting trans the medicalization essentially of children and humans and in prisoners and everything uh, just on the transgender issue. Her talk, her response has been, I will follow the law, which is a non-answer because as the chief executive, she's going to promote laws. She's going to ask her party to draft up legislation to, you know, try and get certain laws passed through the Senate and through the House. And if she can change the law, she will. So this answer of like, I will follow the law is a very telling answer, in my opinion. Yeah, I hope you followed the law because you are the president. So thanks for clearing that up. It's a non-answer because you know that you're going to shift and change. And quite honestly, there's tons of ways for the president, the sitting president to kind of circumvent the law. I mean, look at just one example, Biden deciding he's just going to forgive all kinds of student loan debt. Like he, you know, Supreme Court's like, nah, he, yeah, I'm going to. And you just find loopholes, you find ways. She will do the same thing. No question. Absolutely. And then she was also asked about Biden's incompetence or I'm sorry, uh, Biden's uh, degrading mental fitness. Thank you. <laughs> Cognitive abilities. Yes, cognitive abilities. And she, I think that was that one question where she just got really flustered, but she's again still protecting him, still defending him, still having a hard time trying to distinguish herself from the Biden administration and how she's going to be different. And then I also thought it was really interesting about uh, before we move on to what's happening on the campaign trail, because she did this interview with NBC. 
She also did a Telemundo interview, which were both recorded. She took the day off yesterday from the campaign trail. I believe she is also taking the day off from the campaign trail today because I think today is the CNN town hall. So she requires all of this time off to prepare for interviews, which really at this point as a presidential candidate should be second nature. And if you are losing momentum in regards to the polls leading up to election day, when we already have early voting going on, the last thing you should be doing is taking days off from the campaign trail. But this woman who is incapable of talking off script, of doing anything that she does not feel is absolutely perfect. I mean, are you, is she going to take days off before she has meetings with foreign adversaries or foreign countries or when she goes to the G? I mean, Biden takes off full weeks now and it's totally normal. I guess this is just what they're able to do. They just stop <laughs> when they can't handle it, when they can't think of something to say, when they make a boo boo. They're like, yeah, I'm just going to call a lid on the day and we'll see you next Tuesday. It's totally fine. Meanwhile, you have Trump getting ready to possibly go on a three hour unscripted podcast with Joe Rogan. And yet they're still making the argument that he is in cognitive decline like Biden. Nobody believes that. Nobody's buying that. They're trying desperately to do the whole like he's just as old. Look at he he, he doesn't have his faculties and stop it. Come on. Stopped. I mean, it's still on brand because I don't know if you guys know this, but this is not a surprise that she has to take time off to prepare because back in, I can't remember, it was a while back, but Axios had this story um, where they reported back in July that this woman had to take time off and set up a mock dinner in preparation for a donor dinner. She was going to go into friendly territory for a donor dinner and she had her staff pretend that they were the guest and set up a mock dinner. Even at one point, they debated whether or not they were going to have her also be drinking wine while she was preparing or practicing for this dinner. It's so bizarre. So weird. But as clearly we can see that the Harris campaign and Harris herself, the voice has changed. Even Obama is out there angry. Yeah, he's turned into like an angry old man, totally bitter mad his rhetoric has changed his tone of speech has changed and he's just he's one step away from the Dwight Schrute pounding on the podium he's just mad so what do we got 13 days to the election 13 days right oh my gosh yep. 13 days to the election we are in a sprint right now or at least the candidates are I mean I guess we are too because we got to get the yep. election and the I feel winded I feel winded yes but tonight, Harris is going to be doing her CNN town hall. So she's going to be taking most of the day to prepare for that. And of course, because CNN hates us and so does Kamala Harris, it will be at 9 p.m. Eastern. Oh, my gosh. With a live audience where she will take, I'm sure, pre-vetted questions, right? Trump is heading to Georgia. He's going to be in Duluth. And then J.D. Vance is going to be in Vegas and I believe Reno, Nevada. We also have the Madison Square Garden campaign rally in New York for Trump coming up, which should be really interesting. I'm very, very interested to see if he can fill Madison Square Garden. Not to mention that he would just love to have that talking point. Oh, yeah. We would ride that wave. And like we've only mentioned a few dozen times already, Trump's going to be Friday speaking to Joe Rogan. But I don't know. We don't know yet what else Harris is going to be doing on the campaign trail itself. I do know that she's talking about going to Texas of all places, which I thought was really interesting. Why? Well, I think she's going to go there to campaign with who is it that's running against uh, Senator Cruz? Oh, Hold right. On. I know what you're talking about, but the name's escaping oh, me. All red. Okay, there he goes. Because she's going to head down to Texas to campaign with All Red, who is running against, is Colin All Red. He's the Democrat candidate for the Senate who is running against Tom, uh, not Tom Cruise. I always call him Tom Cruise. <laughs> Ted Cruz. Well, that just, honestly, that shows how freaked out they are, too, about the possibility that they lose not only the White House, but the Senate. So, I mean... They are concerned. There is also concern that the Cruz all red ticket is kind of close, although Cruz is ahead and I doubt that. But they have this dream 
somehow that they will flip Texas. Like that is their dream that they can flip Texas. So they keep, it's like the whole Beto O'Rourke thing for a while. You know what I mean? They just keep going there really hoping that they can flip Texas. Yeah. Um, because if they can flip Texas, then they won't have to care about, they'll have California and Texas and they won't have to care about anything else ever again. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So that is really their hope. <laughs> yeah. But needless to say, we always like to talk a little bit about what is happening in regards to polls in the state of the election. And uh, yeah, Trump's got this. It's looking really good for him. The average for Real Clear Politics have Trump up by 1.1, which is doesn't sound like a lot, but that is across the board. That is an average. He is up on every single swing state, right? Wow. The biggest one being Pennsylvania, which is by a hair because the average in Pennsylvania is like 0.8. But mind you, back in 2020, Biden was plus five and Clinton was also plus five, almost six. So for Trump to be up by even a hair is huge. And if he takes Pennsylvania, she's pretty much toast. Yeah, it's looking great. And I'm it, objectively speaking, this is not just because I want Kamala Harris to lose. It's very favorable for Trump right now. And I would feel very confident and very nervous if I would feel confident if I was in the Trump campaign and profoundly nervous if I was working for Kamala right now. And I think we're seeing I, that play out in the panic and the shrill shrieking of so many leftists in the media right now. Absolutely. And it was funny because I was actually talking to my husband. I've, I've mentioned this a few times because I had a moment there where I was like, on the fence, we've talked about this. I was like, yeah, maybe, I don't know. I'm not going to say anything. And then like, I said it out loud. Like, I think he's going to win. And I go through these moments. I'm at home and I'm like all excited and happy because I was like, we're totally going to win and it's totally going to be awesome. And they're all going to cry. and It's going to be great. And then I get like a little bit of a panic because I feel like something's going to happen and the rug's going to be pulled out from underneath me. And I don't want to be like devastated. You know what I mean? Because we even yeah. have like Nate Silver, his streams have already crossed. Also, he's giving Trump a 53% chance of winning versus Harris at 46. And Yikes. most interesting, absentee voting in Pennsylvania, because like I'm obsessed with Pennsylvania right now. They've already started early voting. They're you know, requesting absentee ballots and turning them in. And Republicans have, are going to meet or exceed their 2020 absentee ballot request in Pennsylvania versus the Democrats aren't even, it's looking like they're not getting close to their 2020 numbers. Wow. Which is huge. If that is, if that's really the information that is coming out because they are getting this data already. And if this is the case, Pennsylvania is looking really good. And what was it that you mentioned about Mark Halpern? Uh, what did he say oh, yeah. yesterday? So... Okay, so there was a tweet that was put out by Colin Rugg, and he basically said, Mark Halperin predicts we will almost certainly know who will be the next president before Election Day. They're encouraging voting early, bringing friends and family with you. Halperin is saying America will likely know who the next president is before Election Day based on early voting trends, adding that official election results should be known on election night. So basically he's saying the early voting is going to be so enormous that day of voting won't even be able to match it. And so we'll know ahead of time, which would break the brains of not only the Harris campaign, but the whole me they wouldn't even know what to do. Like they have been they prepare, this is what they live for. Their whiteboards and their graphics and their talking points. They are so prepped and ready, not only for Kamala to win, but for this huge production. And can you imagine if the early voter turnout was so enormous that it dwarfed the day of voting and really kind of made it inconsequential? So that's what Mark Halperin's saying. Well, I don't know if I believe it, but. I think he has a pretty good point, and it's especially when you look at early voting in certain states, Pennsylvania being one of them. And it's another reason, like, I understand that a lot of our listeners may have reservations about early voting. Like, I did some stories last night, and I just, not even thinking, did a flippant comment of, like, early voting, if you can go early vote, go do it now. And this is one of the reasons why. You know, one of the things about there's multiple things. Anything can happen on election day. Things can go sideways. Your car could break down. The weather could be weird. You know, there are those challenges, but also the fact that 
you know, like if you want to play a mind game on the Democrats, play a mind game by doing early voting. Because this data, especially not in all states, but in most states, is accessible before election day. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) to mess with their brains a little bit and let them know and like kind of, I don't know, put a damper on their spirits. I know it doesn't sound very nice, but go early vote. Because then the, when it's like when you can kind of get that positive momentum out, it then pushes other people to because they want to be part of the winning team. But when they're thinking that they're going to lose, they just kind of like let it go and give up and move on. And so if we're going to be playing psychological games, we can play it both ways. And this is this is the way I think we should be doing it for this election in 2024. So that is why, that is one of the reasons, there's multiple reasons, but it is also one of the reasons that I am telling you to get off your tuchus and go early vote. Okay, now I am going to speak now for the people who uh, might have reservations about early voting, but really I'm just gonna say, I'm sorry, this is over. No, we're done. That's the wrap. one, One half of this podcast votes day of, and I have my whole life, it's a, tradition in our family we wake up early we take the kids when they're young enough we let them actually like vote for us and punch the ticket or mark the what the bubble and we do that for primaries and the general election and so it's okay if you want to vote day of i will be voting day of mercedes will give me a bunch of side eyes that day and every day leading up to it but i'm here to also affirm your choice to i am Pro-choice about voting. How's that? The only time I'll be pro-choice. I'm pro-choice about voting. You may vote day of and you are fine. I really, I do think that, especially if you're using it as a lesson to create and instill enthusiasm in your children to participate in the civic process of voting, I think that's awesome. But also, I don't know, (laughs) go early vote. You're just not going to... You're not going to let it die. It's fine. It's fine. I am taking my children on day up. We're all going to, and I'm still going to vote. We're all going to be okay. But, you know, you can take it or leave it. That's my opinion. Well, it's okay. You're in Virginia. The likelihood of the I don't know, though. I kind of feel like Virginia could clip. You never know. We did elect a Republican governor. So you never know. That would be freaking awesome. You know, Harris did not go to the Al Smith dinner. So it's possible that she could lose 49 states. It'd be great. That would be so epic. I mean, I can't even I know. imagine. All right. Well, friends, we're going to go ahead and wrap us up. And as we are approaching Election Day, we just want to uh, reassure you that we are going to be here through Election Day and probably through the inauguration, because I'm sure depending on who wins, things are going to be interesting post-election. But we're going to be here as campaign games And then, I don't know, maybe we'll be talking about what's going to happen after the election. That's just a little bit of a teaser. Yeah. Things that we're contemplating. No Mm -hmm. official announcements yet. But let's go ahead and wrap up today's episode of Campaign Games. And, you know, we talked about the happy campaign, the not so happy campaign, and the complete meltdown of the media. But if you have enjoyed today's episode and every episode before that, or if you're new here, doesn't matter. We are now your new favorite podcast. You're going to hit that follow button. So you don't miss the next episode. We're going to be here again on Friday. And because we are your new favorite podcast, you're going to leave us a five-star rating, a happy, kind review, and you're going to share it with your friends because sharing is caring. And if you share it on your social media, make sure that you tag us so we can share it on ours and that we, you know, we get the heads up and we can share the love. So thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you on Friday for the next episode of Campaign Games, the game of survival for both the candidates and the voters. Bye everyone. Bye.